If you have a Bible, turn it to uh, Revelation chapter 21. We'll be looking at the last two chapters of Revelation this morning. And there's a story about a preacher who was preaching from this very passage one Sunday morning, and he was at the dramatic conclusion of the sermon, and he, and he stands in front of his congregation, and he says, okay, everybody that wants to go to heaven, rise to your feet. And so immediately, everyone in the congregation jumped up with excited uh, exuberance and just, was just, just, just jumped up and were standing on their feet, except for one person. And over on this side of the area, sanctuary, there was a, a little boy about 10 or 11 years old, and he was still sitting down. Everybody else was standing up, was smiling, you know, yes, we want to go to heaven. And the preacher, of course, you know, you try not to let things as a preacher distract you in the audience. You try not to let those things bother you, and you just try to push through and move through and whatever. But he just couldn't, he couldn't get over this little boy that wasn't standing up. Why didn't this little boy want to go to heaven? And so he stopped, and he said, well, son, it, wh- wh- why aren't you standing? don't you want to go to heaven when you die? And the little boy said, stood up. He said, well, of course, when I die, I thought you were getting a group to go around right now. <laughs> ever felt like that? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, have you ever felt like that? You know, the next to the last sentence in the book of Revelation is found in verse 20. And it simply says, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And, you know, there are days when we feel like screaming that from the top of our lungs. There are days that, that things just don't seem to go right. There are days when, when the toil and the suffering of this wor- world seem very serious, very real to us, when the checkbook doesn't quite balance right, whenever uh, our families are having issues, whether there's, uh, you know, all these different things going on. I remember when I was a kid, the, this commercial, and it was a, a mother in a busy day, you know, and the kids are going crazy, and the mother, all of a sudden, she stops and she says, Calgon, take me away. You saw it too, yes. And that's kind of the moment we think of and we say, yeah, yes, you know, when we're in the middle of those days, we want to stop and say, come, Lord Jesus, just get it over with already. Just come, Lord Jesus. We want you to come here. And then there, there are those days, of course, when our sentiment is a little, di- little bit different. And it's more like this. It's come, Lord Jesus, just not yet. It's, days that we, it's those days that we're having a pretty good day. When things are going well, but maybe the checkbook not only balances, but there's a little bit of extra at the end of the month. When the, those days when our, our families are getting together, you know, going along in perfect harmony, and there's these days that, that you just you have a great day and a great time, and you, you're having so much fun, and, and all these things. And, and, you know, like today, you know, the, the Chiefs start their, their, their uh, historic Super Bowl run starting today, you know, and I'm thinking, just Jesus, wait till the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, and then Jesus maybe says, I don't have that long, you know, so, uh, but, but you know, you I got these days and you're just like, come Lord Jesus, just, just not yet. I'm not quite ready yet. You see, I think we have a, a, a bit of a problem and I think it might just be a vision problem. Now the Bible says in Colossians three, that we are to set our hearts and minds on things above and not on earthly things. To set our hearts and minds on things above, on things of heaven, rather than on earthly things in our lives. And if you think about it, that really should be a no-brainer. That should not even have to be a verse that's in the Bible. To set our mind and hearts on things above instead of on earthly things. Because we're talking about the difference between the things of God, complete perfection, and the things of man. We're we're talking about the difference between the completely incomplete and and, and completely perfect. We're talking about the difference between the eternal and the temporary. And we're talking about the things, really, the the good and the bad. And and you see all these different things, and it really should be a no-brainer that this is the stuff that I'm focused on, the things above, the things of God. And we're talking about the the world that God intended uh, in in the world we actually live in compared to the world we actually live in. You know, this this world that God intended, that's the the things above. The the world we actually live in, that's the things below. That's, That's the things of this world. Now, you remember the world that God intended, right? We read about it in Genesis chapter 1, the story where God created the heavens and the earth, and in the first five days, he created the day and the night and the sky and the sea and the land and all that grew on it and the sun and the stars and the moon, the fish and the birds. Then on day six, he created all the the living creatures that were on the face of the earth, and he created man and woman. And then we read that God took a step back and he saw that it was very good. Now, when the creator of the universe creates something and says it's very good, you can, you can bet that it's in pretty good shape. 
It's very good. In the world, it was in perfect harmony, and God and mankind had unhindered fellowship with one another. That's what we see in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. But then Genesis chapter 3 happens. And sin entered the world, and with it came pain and suffering and decay and death, and worst of all, came separation of God and mankind. And I don't know about you, but that's a, the kind of place that's a pretty easy place to despise if you think about it. You know, a place where people, where even children suffer uh, daily under the pains of poverty and abuse. A place where disease is a daily reality in every one of our lives. We're affected by some sort of a disease each and every day. A place where continual wars take lives and hate manifests itself and things like we've seen in the past couple of weeks, these beheading uh, of journalists. A place where death impacts each and every one of us in some way. But somehow, some way, even though that place is pretty easy to despise when you think about it, when it's really not a very nice place to be, somehow, some way, we start to think that, you know, maybe this place isn't so bad after all. Maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's not so bad. Yeah, all those things are not good, but maybe, just maybe, there, there's some redeeming qualities here. When, when I was a kid growing up, there was something evil in the midst of my household. My dad's here today, and it wasn't him, so don't worry, Dad. I'm not going to say it was you. But, but the existence of this thing, it, it led to the persecution and the suffering of the children in the household. And we despise its very existence. It was my father's garden. Oh, we hated that garden. We hated that garden because it pulled us from more pleasurable tasks, such as uh, watching cartoons, and to the miserable task of watering and weeding in the middle of a hot summer. And we hated it because we would spend hours hunched over green bean plants that led to sore backs and sweat running into our eyes and they sting our eyes. And, and, and even worse than that, we hated that garden. And even worse than that was what this garden produced. Now, I was okay with a lot of the stuff that came out of that garden. I didn't mind it so much. But there was one particular plant that was nothing but a vile weed, in my opinion. And it was one of these. It was the yellow squash plant. Oh, I loathe that plant. <laughs> I loathe this vegetable. I loathe its taste. I loathe its texture. I hated the way it felt in my mouth. I hated the way it tasted. And, and it didn't matter how it was prepared, whether it was grilled or fried or breaded or whatever, it still just made my stomach turn. And, but, but if you grew up in my house, you ate whatever was being fixed or you went hungry. That was the rule. If you don't like it, then you're going to go hungry. And so year after year after year, I choked down that vile yellow squash. But sometime around the time I was in high school, about the time I was graduate, to graduate high school actually, something interesting happened. I didn't gag quite as much when I ate that vile weed. In fact, by the time I graduated high school, I secretly kind of liked it, even though I never would have told my dad that. And after I got married uh, and no longer how, needing to eat it, you know, I got married and I thought, this is where I've arrived because now I, I'm a big boy now. I don't have to eat anything I don't want to eat. And so I thought there's not going to be a vile weed of squash. There's not going to be uh, bologna. There's not going to be any of that stuff, potato soup, all that disgusting food. I'm never going to eat it again, never again. But I found myself, particularly with the squash, craving it, even though I never had it anymore. And so you know what? That evil garden and that vile weed they become a part of my household now by choice. We now persecute our children with back-breaking garden work. And yes, one of the main plants in our garden is the yellow squash. I love the yellow squash now. Man, it's good. A little butter sauteed, a little grit. Oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> now we have a division in the church. Way to go. Okay. <laughs> And I think that's what happens a lot of times with this broken world we live in. You know, we tolerated it first. We're just like, yeah, I just want to, I got to be here. This is, this is not my home, but I got to be here. And we tolerate the, the, the stuff of it. And then, and then we kind of get used to it. We kind of get used to the world around us. And then at some point, we even get attached to it. And maybe we get attached to, to some of the sinful substitutes that God's offered, or that not, that's, uh, uh, substitutes to God that's offered to us. 
These sinful substitutes that, that are out there, these completely incomplete things that, that may look good to, the, to, 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 to see and, and smell good and taste good and, and, and feel good and all these different things, and they attract us and they pull us in. And, you know, we, we secretly, we, we want to we say we're against that. We don't want to sin, but, but really secretly someplace in the depth of our heart that we don't want to talk about, we kind of really like that stuff. And so we get attached to that selfish stuff. We get attached to that sin. Maybe that's one reason why we get attached to this world. Or maybe we just become attached to the temporary joys. You know, I, I love, my dad's been here this weekend. I've loved spending time with my dad. I love spending time with my kids. I love spending time with my family, my friends. And, you know, I, I think, man, I, I don't, this is good stuff. Maybe we get attached to that. Maybe we get attached to the, the finer things in life, the, the little bitty jo- the, the joys that God gives us and allows us to have on this earth. And we think, man, I, I love this stuff. I just, we become attached to that, and so we become attached to the world. But as we saw it with the great prostitute in the earlier chapters of Revelation, and that as attractive as sin is, it will lead to our destruction. And we must be careful that we don't hold on to the gifts of God in this world so tightly that they become gods themselves. As it happened in Romans chapter 1 where we read that they, they gave themselves over to their desires and they started worshiping created things rather than the creator. We can't do that in our lives. And so that could be one reason why we have a hard time getting our hearts and minds to be set on things above is that we just get too attached to the things below. We're, we're too focused on the things below to ever set our hearts and minds on the things above. But I think there's another reason we struggle. I think there's another reason that we struggle, and it's in this reason that we have our vision problem. And, and it's perhaps the main reason we have a tendency to say, come, Lord Jesus, just not yet. I think it's because uh, it's, it's a, we have a distorted view of heaven. We have a distorted view of eternity and heaven. I, I've been saving this illustration in my sock drawer for several years now. I had to put it there so nobody would actually use it. What it is, it's a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> And I got this toilet paper out of a hotel, and the reason I got it is because of the brand it is. It is Heavenly Choice toilet paper. Heavenly Choice double layer bathroom tissue. I've, I mean, I've been tempted to use this, I, I tell you. I mean, just the name itself is drawing me and beckoning me. But isn't this kind of what we, the view we have of heaven sometime? You know, why do they use Heavenly Choice on a roll of toilet paper? Because we think of heaven, we think of fluffy clouds and light and, and beautiful and all these different things. And so we put heavenly on toilet paper because that's what we want to, you know, want to say, that this toilet paper is, is fluffy and it's soft and it's all these things, these views of heaven that we might have, right? Who wants to experience a little heavenly choice in their life? Anybody? There you go. Have some heavenly choice toilet paper. And that's, that's what we think of when we think of heaven. We think of you know, clouds and softness and fuzziness and maybe some pearly gates and a, and a harp or two. And that's, you know, that's kind of the picture we have. We see it in the cartoons. We see it on TV. We see it all. This is the, the picture of heaven that we have. In fact, the morning that uh, I was kind of completing this sermon, someone posted this on Facebook as I was doing it. It's this, this is actually from my Facebook feed. Someone in heaven loves me. Share if you love someone in heaven. Now, I don't want to downplay the comfort we have from knowing the people who die in Christ, our loved ones who die in Christ, are with Christ. I don't want to downplay that at all. But what I don't like about this is that it kind of gives this idea that heaven is some sort of uh, uh, clouded waiting room where people are just waiting to come. You know, I I can't wait to see my, you know, loved ones. When, when, When I really think that when you look at Scripture, that there's so much much more than than a cloud-filled waiting room. And that, quite frankly, if I die today, I probably ain't going to sit on a park bench in the clouds waiting for you all to get there. No offense or anything. I probably have some other things on my mind, like being in the presence of my Lord and Savior. And it's not just what the world thinks. It's often what the, world, or what the church teaches as well. I remember when I was a kid growing up in a little bitty church in northwest Oklahoma, and, and I was sitting in the pew, and the preacher was talking about heaven, and he said this. He said, if you don't, if you don't like singing, you ain't going to like heaven. And I sat there, a 10 or 11-year-old boy, and listened to that, and, and I was in a church where uh, we would sing the first, second, and last verse of the hymn, and sometimes we'd sing the, the, the same verse over because we forgot that we'd sang the first verse, you know, that kind of stuff. And I didn't really care much for the worship and singing that we had at our church at the time when I was growing up, and, and he said, if you don't like singing, you ain't going to like heaven. And I sat there and thought, oh my gosh, I ain't going to like heaven. 
I ain't going to like heaven because now we're going to go and we're going to sing all four verses in heaven. You know, we're going to do it all the time. And, and this is the view of heaven, you know. And so I think we have a distorted view. And I think when we forget about what eternity is all about, when we forget what eternity is about, a couple of things happen to us. First of all, I think we start to live for the here and now. When we start to, 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 to kind of water down what eternity is about or we kind of get a, a distorted view of what eternity is about, we start to live for the here and now because it just doesn't seem like there's that much better in, in, in the future for us. That, you know, this is the good old days, as it were. That someday I'm going to be in heaven singing all six verses of some hymn, looking back and thinking, man, I miss those days on earth. We, and we, we would never say that out loud, but I think that's how we live sometimes. We live for the here and now. And then I think there's also, if we don't live for the here and now, then maybe we just don't live with any hope. We live with no hope. We have this idea that, that hope, uh, you know, what, what do we have to look forward to? Is it really standing around and singing all the time? Is it sitting on a cloud and playing a harp? Is it really, you know, we don't have hope in those things. And the truth is, is that those temptations of living in the here and now and living with no hope, those are the exact same temptations that the church faced when Revelation was written. And why it was written. It was the, the seven churches in the original audience. They would have faced, it, faced these temptations to live for the here and now or to live with no hope. And so Jesus ends his revelation to the church with a picture of eternity. And if we're to set our hearts and minds on things above, and we, we need to hear those words with uh, fresh ears and renewed imaginations. And so before we read this passage, let's just, let's just pray right now. Let's pray. God, help us to hear these words Help us to hear your word with fresh ears. Help us to unleash our imaginations to see that, you know, the, not that you're telling us literally what's going on here, but you're giving us a mental picture of what we have to look forward to. Help us to see that. Help us to, help us to see it clearly and allow the Holy Spirit to, to speak directly to our hearts and help us to have a, a real perception of what you want us to see in this passage. We pray this in Jesus' name. Once again, I, uh, as we did a few weeks ago, I asked you to do something a little different. You know, normally we put the words on the screen of the scripture and I ask you to follow along as I read. But this time I really, I want you to put aside your Bible. I want you, because this, this book was meant, it was written to be heard as opposed to be read and dissected. And so set your Bible aside and listen as I read passages from you, for you from Revelation 20. 1 and 22. If you want to close your eyes and try to imagine what this is, I encourage you to do that as well. Starting with Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with man, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the land. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be twelve thousand stadia in length. And as wide and high as it is long, he measured its wall, and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. 
The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The twelve gates were the twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is, as, is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in this city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen? Now, I don't believe that, you know, th- this is a great passage of Scripture we have, great symbolism, great uh, 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 words to, to spark our imagination about the nature of eternity. I don't, it's hard, though, to truly capture the glory that we'll see in eternity. In fact, I don't think anything on this earth can truly do so. And I don't believe that I am capable to preach a sermon that's going to all of a sudden flip the switch from clouds and, and, and uh, halos to the true vision of what eternity is going to be like. And so this week I have prayed that the Holy Spirit will give us a glimpse of the reality of eternity so we can set our heart and minds on things above. But I think there are three images that describe eternity in this passage that will really help us see eternity clearer. Three images that we need to take note of. In the first one, we see that that, that eternity is a new paradise. It's a new paradise. Now look at the three things that are, or the things that are similar in the old paradise, which of course we talk about uh, Eden, uh, Garden of Eden being the old paradise, and then we have the new one that we see in Revelation. First of all, you look at Genesis chapter 2, go ahead and put that on the screen. Genesis chapter 2, we see a river uh, from the garden, that there was a river uh, going through Eden and it was separated into four headwaters. And then we look at Revelation 22, verse 1, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. And so from the throne, you know, it shows, that, by the way, in Revelation 22, it shows that it's an eternal flow, that it's never going to run dry. It always is coming. Uh, this water of life is always coming from the throne of God. It's the water of life. And of course, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, we have the tree of life that we see existing in the garden. And then on, in Revelation 22, verse 2, we see on the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And so we see not only is it there, but notice that he really emphasizes how productive this tree is in eternity. But even better than what we see similar to the old paradise and the new paradise uh, is what we see that, it, that it is not in the new paradise. It's what is missing in the new paradise that makes this a great thing. Look at, we take a look at Revelation 21.1. We see that there is no sea. Now, when you think about sea for us, you know, we, we don't really think of it bad necessarily. We want to go to the beach. We want to go on a cruise. We like, you know, this idea of the beautiful sea, the sunset over the, over, the, over the ocean, whatever the case may be. But in the original audience, they would have associated the sea with separation and turbulence. And that was not a peaceful thing for the original audience. The sea would have meant destruction. The sea would have meant uh, insecurity, turbulence, all these things. And so this idea that there's no sea in the new, in the new paradise, that was good news to the original audience. That's good news that there's peace there. Also, we see that's missing is that there are no tears. There's no mourning, nor, no death, no crying or pain. We read that in Revelation 21.4. Imagine that for just a second, if you will. Maybe think about your the last couple weeks of your life. Things that may have caused you tears or maybe death that you've heard of or things that caused you to mourn or cry or to give you pain. What what would your life have been like in the last week if those five things were missing? Just imagine that for a second. Then we see in Revelation 21.7, another thing that's missing 
is there's no deceit. Nobody that's going to deceive us is going to be present in this place. And so there's nothing then to tempt us from our God, nothing to try to attract us or seduce us. And then we see in Revelation 22, verse 2, that there are no restrictions to the tree of life. Now, there was no restrictions to the tree of life originally in the, in the book of Genesis, as we see, but there were to the knowledge of good and evil. And so, but when they sinned, when they ate that tree, of uh, the fruit of that tree, God banished them from the garden and put an angel with a sword in front of the gate so that they wouldn't get in and, and, and touch and, and eat the, the tree of life. But we see that the, the, this tree in, in the new eternity, the new paradise, it's, it's fruitful all the time. It's there. It's, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations, we see. And then we see, finally, it really encompasses everything in Revelation 22, 3, is that there's, just, there's no curse. The curse of sin is missing. It's gone. All the, the, the side effects of sin that we struggle with each and every day of our life is not going to be there. And you notice, I hope you did anyway, that, that, that we have one thing that's been majorly wrong in our theology, is that whenever this world is done with, we don't go to heaven. Heaven comes to us. If we don't go to heaven, heaven comes to us. We see how the, the, the new uh, heaven and the new earth come into being and the, the city comes down to us. And so in essence, what God does is he finishes his work of re- redemption, of reconciliation, of restoration. And his work, his plan is complete, and heaven and earth are restored to the way God intended it. And I've said it before, but I like what Max Lucado said, that it's, it's going to be like the Garden of Eden again without the snake. That's going to be a great place to be. It's a new paradise. But we see that eternity is also described as a new city. Revelation 21, uh, verse 2, John wrote that he saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. And i got to tell you that a city has not always been my vision of heaven. I actually grew up, as I've said before, in northwest Oklahoma with big skies and wheat fields as far as the eye could see. When I was growing up, the closest McDonald's was 60 miles away. The closest shopping mall was 72 miles away. We talked about, there was a phrase that we used in the town that I grew up in. If somebody was going to have an exciting weekend, they would go to the city. The city was Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City was over three hours away from where we lived. And we enjoyed going to the city. We enjoyed going to Oklahoma City because they had big malls and they had amusement parks and they had all the best restaurants. But as much as we like to visit, most of us wouldn't want to live there. We'd go to the city, we'd, we'd have a good time, but we'd be ready to go home because get out of the hustle and bustle. Because as much as we like to visit, you know, the city meant the noise, it meant traffic, it meant pollution, it meant crime, and all those things. And so, you know, why does Revelation then talk about heaven as a city? Well, believe it or not, I know it's hard to believe, but it's a metaphor in the book of Revelation. It's a metaphor for uh, uh, when you strip all the buildings and the noise and the traffic away. Cities are simply collections of people living together. And a city is a symbol of community. And New Jerusalem is the community of God's people. The New Jerusalem is the community of God's people, the, uh, of, of the church. And that's why we read in Revelation chapter 21 too, where he says, I saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Of course, we know that the bride of Christ represents the church. And the city represents the people of God living together forever. The 12 gates uh, in Revelation 21 verse 12, it bear the name of Israel's 12 tribes. So that's talking about God's Old Testament people. And then we have uh, the 12 foundations in 2114 that bear the name of the 12 apostles, and that represents God's New Testament people. And so all of God's people are going to be living together. And so what we see, though, along with this, by the way, you know, we, another thing, when we talk about bad ideas of, uh, of heaven, you know, the streets of gold thing, they don't impress me much. I mean, I like gold as much as the next guy, but, you know, this idea that a preacher would stand up and say, when you get to heaven, you're going to walk on streets of gold. And I'm just like, who cares what color the streets are? But again, this is a metaphor. This is, these are symbols. This is not real reality. This, this is a, a, a visual image. And so what we see in the nature of this city and its description is it is beautiful. That we do see streets of gold. We see precious stones. We see pearls. We see all these things that, that are of high value that, you know, gold doesn't rust. We see all these things that are eternal in nature, that are, that are highly valuable and beautiful. And so we see that the nature of this city, of God's community of people, is it's beautiful. We also see that it's perfect. If you read there, it has perfect symmetrical proportions. 
And that represents the perfection of this community. Have you ever heard me say or heard somebody say that the church is imperfect because it's full of imperfect people? Well, guess what? The new city is going to be perfect because it's full of perfected people. It's perfect because it's full of perfected people, all clothed with the perfection of Christ and made new and holy for all eternity. You know, again, go back and imagine this for a second. Can you imagine living in a community without manipulation? To live in a community without abuse, without insecurity, without fear or selfishness. John Ortberg did a good job characterizing it, I think, and and, uh, talking about what that would look like if we had a city that was truly without sin. He says, in a world redeemed from sin, all marriages would be healthy and all children would be safe. Those who have, who have too much would give to those who have too little. Israeli and Palestinian children would play together on the West Bank. Their parents would build homes for one another. In offices and corporate boardrooms, executives will secretly scheme to help their colleagues succeed. They would compliment them behind their backs. Tabloids would be filled with accounts of courage and moral beauty. Talk shows would feature mothers and daughters who love each other deeply, wives who give birth to their husbands' children, and men who secretly enjoy dressing as men, believe it or not. Disagreements would be settled with grace and civility. There would be still be lawyers, perhaps, but they would have really, really useful jobs like delivering pizza, which would be non-fat and low in cholesterol. Doors would have no locks. Cars would have no alarms. Schools would no longer need police presence or even hall monitors. Students and teachers and janitors would honor and value one another's work. At recess, every kid would be picked for a team. Churches would never split. People would, neither, would be neither bored nor hurried. No father would ever again say, I'm too busy, to a disappointed child. Divorce courts and battered women's shelters would be turned into community recreation centers. Every time one human being touched another, it would be to express encouragement, affection, and delight. No one would be lonely or afraid. People of different races would join hands. They would honor and be enriched by their differences and be united in their common humanity. And at the center of this entire community will be its magnificent architect and most glorious resident, God himself. Can you imagine a place like that, a community like that? I, I would like that place. I wouldn't mind living there at all. But lastly, we see that eternity is described as, an, as a new temple. And this, is, this may be a little strange here because, you know, John says and he writes in Revelation 21, 22 that he did not see a temple because the Lord God and the Lamb are his temple. But I want you to consider this for a moment. In 1 Kings chapter 6, we see the description and the dimensions of the temple that was built by Solomon in the Old Testament. And we have the overall dimensions, we have the the dimensions of the portico and and each of the different aspects of the temple, both the description and, and how long and wide and that sort of thing they were. But fast forward to Revelation 21 and we see the dimensions of the city in verse 16. This is what it says. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and high as it is long. And once again, what we see here is we talked about the number 12 being complete and and, and we have 12,000 to be symbolic and the dimensions are vast and complete. It's, It's just that it's a vast and complete city measurement. But notice in this that the city was not only a square, perfect square, but it was also as high as it is long. In other words, the city is a perfect cube. It's a perfect cube. It's 12,000 stadia wide, you know, vast, complete wide. It's the same length. It's the same height. It's a per- complete cube. We'll go back to, to 1 Kings 6 for a second. And we find one thing in this description of the Old Testament temple that is described as a perfect cube. We find it in verse 19. He prepared the inner sanctuary within the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 wide, and 20 high. You see, this inner sanctuary is what was known as the Holy of Holies in the temple, which was the temple's innermost room where God dwelled between the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant. And this was the most restricted room of the temple. As you may remember, only the high priest could go into this room and only could he go in one time after a series of cleansing so he could be worthy to enter in to the presence of God just for one day. It was the most restricted room in the temple. You know, what a coincidence that it's exactly cubed and this new city this is exactly cubed as well. 
Can you imagine why that would be? I mean, it's, it's amazing that those two things, that's a really good coincidence. But you see what happened is that back in the Old Testament, God was pretty hard to get to. The, there was levels of, of entry. The you know, Gentiles could go to this certain part, and then Jewish people could go to this certain part, and then priests, and then only the high priest could get in the, in, the, in the innermost cube, the Holy of Holies, and only once a year. But that is not true in the new eternal temple. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, we read it in Matthew chapter 27, in, Ma- in Mark chapter 15, and in Luke 23, that the temple curtain separating the Holy of Holies from God's people was ripped from top to bottom. And this was God saying that no longer did mankind need to be separated from God because of our sin. Because Christ paid the price for our sin when he died on the cross. And through the death and resurrection of Jesus, then we were able to receive God himself, the Holy Spirit, into our hearts. And so spiritually, there is no longer any separation between man and God when we are in Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living within us to guide us, to direct us, to empower us. And all those things are are there because God himself spiritually is living within us. But when this new heaven and this new earth are ushered in, our spiritual fellowship with God that we can experience right here and right now will find its fullness physically as well. And God opens up the curtain to his dwelling place and he proclaims that the place where he lives is not just a place for God's people to visit occasionally. It's a place for them to live for all eternity. That no longer do we have to go through some sort of a ritual because Christ took care of it. That no longer do we have to be restricted access to the Holy of Holies. That the entire new city, the entire community of God's people is the new Holy of Holies. And guess what? The gates are never shut. The gates are never shut. And not only that, but God is right there in the midst of his people. And Revelation 21, 3 says, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And this word dwell is huge. Because this is not just a matter of saying he's going to come and visit. He's going to come down from the throne and hang out and do like a presidential handshake kind of thing, photo op. It's he's going to live with his people. He's going to be with them all for all eternity. And so it's a new temple. The entire place is God's presence. And so how should we respond in anticipation of this new heaven and earth? What should we do knowing that this new paradise is coming where, where it's like the Garden of Eden without the snake and it's got all these things that are missing? No more uh, sea, no more death, mourning, crying, or pain, no more tears, no more curse. What do we do in anticipation of those things? How should we live knowing that a new city of God's people will be built? That God's creating uh, uh, his bride to be a community of, of people in which he will be dwelling among them. How will we, should we live or how will our lives be shaped knowing that God will welcome us into his eternal presence through Christ? Well, again, I think we should heed the words of Paul in Colossians 3 where he said, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And so what we do, we have those things in mind. We have that picture of eternity in our mind. There's a couple of things we do. First of all, it means we don't live for the here and now, but we start living for the eternal. We don't live for the here and now, but we live for the eternal. And, and, and what that means is that, people, do you see what we've got ahead of us? Do you want others to experience that too? Or are we so selfish as God's people that we just decide that, The world is not worth our effort and time and discomfort to tell them about Christ so that they can too experience this new paradise, this new city, this new temple. I love, I think I've used it before, but it's this idea of a supermarket sample giver. We want to to stand in the supermarket of the world and bring little pieces of that eternity, that reality that we're going to experience, that complete reconciliation, that complete redemption And we need to bring it to people and say, look at this and taste this. Taste this and see it as, you know, a supermarket person, their their job is to give you a taste so that you will want to buy the product. We need to give people a taste of Christ and his power. We need to give a people the taste of the eternity that is to come. We need to give a people, as Jesus said and prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And we need to go out and make that true, to make that possible, to make it, to, to reduce the, 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 the frustrations, the tears, the pain through the grace and power of God. And when we do that, we say, look, this is what God is offering us, not just right now, but for all eternity. And see, when we do that now, and, then, and we, we stop living for the here and now. It's not about what I'm doing in my job or what I'm doing in my neighborhood or what I'm doing with my 401k or what I'm doing with all this stuff that's temporary. It's about what am I doing that makes an echo into eternity. And we have a clear vision of the new paradise and the new city and the new temple. We should be, everything we do should have eternal purposes behind it. But I think it's also, it also means that we live with hope. Remember we talked about that before, that uh, uh, the, uh, Ger- uh, the American prisoners of war in the German camps, if you remember correctly, they found out four days before the, pr- the, the guards did that the war was over, and it, things changed for them. They started singing, they started uh, telling jokes, they started laughing, they started being nice to the guards that were persecuting them. Nothing changed for the guards, but everything changed for the people because they knew salvation was coming and it was coming soon. We need to be live, living with that kind of hope in our life. You see, this is the message of Revelation. Yes, there will be suffering, but God's people are already s- sealed. Yes, there will be trouble, but our witness should be bold. Yes, things will get worse, but for those who persevere, the reward is coming, and the victory has already been won. Amen? And with this vision of eternity that we see in this book, as we've pulled back the curtain and see what the reality is for all eternity, we can press on as God's people because Jesus ends with this promise. And I want to end with this today. Would you stand as I read this for you from Revelation 22, starting with verse 12. This is how Jesus ends his revelation to us, to the church. He says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will, have, I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him hear, says, come, whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes the words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for your promises. Thank you for this wonderful book and the message it gives us that things are bad, that things are going to get worse, but we win. And the message that God's team wins, your team wins. We need to pick a team and not be stupid about it. And so, Lord, help us to live this day and every day with eternity in mind, with the purposes of eternity and with the hope that comes from the promises you've given to us. And of course, God, all of this is made possible because you sent your only son to die on the cross and to rise again so that we might have eternal life. God, help us to live with this vision of eternity in our minds and in our hearts each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name.